Okay. So we are finishing up our notes on the third and fourth uh, ecumenical councils of the Roman Catholic Church. Keep in mind, the church that belongs to Christ uh, is still in existence. It's underground during this period of time because of uh, persecution from the Catholic Church. They were considered heretics during this period of time. Uh, and so uh, most of our of the Christian history that we have really only comes from Roman Catholic sources. Uh, so we've been talking about the Council of Chalcedon, and this council was brought together once again by an emperor of, of uh, Rome in an effort to try to stop the gradual split that has been taking place between the Eastern Roman Catholic Church and the Western Roman Catholic Church, the Jewish side of it versus the Roman side of it. Uh, ultimately, nothing can is going to stop it. Uh, but part of the main issue is continuing revision of trying to define the nature of Jesus between his divine side and his human side. And of course, all this centers around a misunderstanding of what the, what the scriptures say. And just as Nolan mentioned in his prayer, man comes up with their own ideas and it just causes more problems. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church believed then and still believes in what they called original or inherited sin. Uh, that sin has been passed down from Adam and thus every person born is born in sin. And there's two variations of that. Either the sin that Adam and Eve committed is also laid to our charge, or that because Adam and Eve sinned, that it defiled the flesh, and thus simply because we're human, we are sinful. But either way, as a result, the debate is centered on that nature of Jesus because since the flesh is inherently sinful, then Jesus, there had to be some sort of uh, division or separation between his divine side and his physical side, otherwise, Jesus, the Son of God, the divine part of him, would be in sin. And, of course, all of that goes back to the fact that we're not born in sin. We're born into a world of sin. We're born into the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. But we're not born in sin. And if that had been understood, then maybe some of this could have been avoided. But, obviously, uh, again, going back to man's ideas. So uh, they issued the Chalcedonian definition, which... Once again, they reworded it to try to, uh, to eliminate any loopholes in the definition of Jesus' nature, his two sides. Uh, it repudiated the notion of a single nature in Christ, declared that he has two natures in one person, and hypostasis, which is that kind of coexistence between the divine and the human. It also insisted on the completeness of his two natures, both the divine side, or Godhead, and his physical side, the man who had part of it. Uh, the council also issued 27 disciplinary canons governing church administration and authority. In a further decree, later known as Canon 28, the bishops declared that the See of Constantinople, which was considered New Rome, had the patriarchal status with equal privileges to the See of Rome. And this caused a big issue on the western side of things, because Constantinople ultimately became kind of the center for the eastern side of the Roman Catholic Church. The Jewish side of things, Constantinople became kind of the hub, whereas Rome obviously was the, the central, centralized location for the Roman Catholic Church in the West. And ultimately this declaration, especially without the Pope present, uh, caused ultimately what would be the lasting split or schism uh, for the most part between the Eastern, what became known as the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and so both the, uh, the, the authority of Constantinople, which according to the West has no apostolic tradition because no apostle established the church in Constantinople, but apostles apparently established a church in Rome, which there's no evidence that says that, but that's what the Roman Catholic Church believed. So, <clears throat> any thoughts so far? The Confession of Chalcedon provides a clear statement on the two natures of Christ, human and divine. And this is what they actually wrote in this Chalcedonian definition. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, who do you think the Holy Fathers are? Do you think those are anybody of the apostles or in the Bible? Who do you think the Holy Fathers were? Huh? Catholic churches doing this? Yeah, yeah. 
Jesus. Well, and, and it's, this ultimately goes back to that first council. Those were who, what they considered the Holy Fathers. Uh, of course, they considered men like Clement I and Ignatius and Arrhenius. These were uh, early church fathers, uh, but the Holy Fathers would have been uh, in association with the first council. Uh, all with one consent, teach people to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable or rational soul and body, co-substantial, co-essential with the Father according to the Godhead, and co co uh, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter, day, latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, the physical side, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, the only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. <sighs> That's a definition for you, isn't it? <laughs> now, you remember we looked at some of these earlier definitions of the first three councils and how they kept kind of flip-flopping and trying to rephrase it? This is the most comprehensive definition they've come up with yet. Not only do they emphasize that he isn't a created being, he has always been. They emphasize the fact that he was, uh, one aspect of this that they mentioned, um, uh, co-substantial or co-essential with the Father, that's that direct link to the fact that he is part of the divine nature, the Godhead. Uh, they address the fact that there was both his soul or his spirit, that's the divine part of him, even though he was in human flesh. Uh, and so it's, it's very comprehensive, this definition. And for the most part, I mean, other than... Per, Perhaps the, the uh, sorry? Yeah, perhaps the exaltation of Mary, uh, born, of the, uh, born of Mary or born of the Virgin Mary would have been enough. But there's, there's beginning to be that exaltation of Mary throughout this. And of course, we saw that a little bit before. Um, I mean, is there anything else that you guys, I mean, other than the weird wording of it, and keep in mind a lot of this was because of some of these false teachings that were arising anyway. Uh, I mean, for the most part, I mean, again, and this last part, the creed of the Holy Fathers, uh, but at least in terms of their definition of Jesus, I don't really see anything in particular that I disagree with. Any, any thoughts on, on that? Was he perfect in both aspects of his being as divine God and as human? Yeah, he was. Was there... A, is this a joint? Is this a, a single personality of our Lord, all as one? Yeah. Okay. There's nothing in the text that suggests that he was two separate people or two separate personalities. Uh, so, uh, I mean, as far as their definition of Jesus, I don't really see anything other than the weird words being used to try to cut off any misunderstandings or deliberate twistings. Um, I don't really see anything that I necessarily disagree with. Yes, sir. Just for my clarification, we're right on that screen, about two thirds of the way down, with us according to the manhood, in all things likened to us without sin. Yeah. They're saying he's, he's of a fleshly nature like we are, but, but he was without sin, but we are still all with sin. Yeah. The, yes. So they're still holding to the fact that we are still in sin. But at least as far as they're concerned, and of course this goes back to trying to, to merge the two together. So it's not two different people. So as soon as Jesus Christ took human form, his holiness, his righteousness purified his flesh. Is kind of how this is going to end up being defined. 
Jesus wasn't born in sin. Uh, he, by his divine nature, made his flesh holy. That's, that's the only real uh, answer that I have found in searching why Jesus was considered without sin versus how man is. And so this was their, this was their go-to thing, is that somehow Jesus, because of his divinity, because he was God, his flesh wasn't sin. That's, and that's kind of the best that they could come up with to be able to explain that away. But isn't that interesting, though, because remember the debate between calling Mary the mother of Christ versus the mother of God? Okay, and, and that debate between the human aspect of giving birth to the human side versus the debate of the, of the God or the divinity side. And so that, that kind of has its origins with some of that, too. Yeah. Yeah, he was born, you know, and of course, that, of course, that goes, yeah, you're right. It goes back to the, the, the her being a virgin type of thing. Obviously, this was a miraculous, uh, immaculate conception, okay? That phrase will come up here in a couple hundred years. Uh, that will kind of be a, be a thing. Yeah. Any other thoughts through this definition? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead. Um, hmm. I, I tend to think this is probably more because nothing in here suggested that they thought he was a created being. I think this is more of a sign. He, he, he has that role of being the begotten son, that he, has, he is the son and the father is the father and the spirit is the spirit. And that role has been, that's the role that he serves, I guess. Because there's nothing in any of this that has ever suggested that even here that they believe that he was created. Uh, so I tend to think that this begotten before all ages just tended to be more that he, the father considered him his son, or was the role he served was of the son before all ages began. That, that would be my response to that. Before time and during after time. Yeah, before time. Yeah, he's eternal. Yeah. So before time, of course, the word was with God. The word was God. That addresses that. Um, yeah, I tend to think that he was, he was the son of God before time started, and since time has existed, he was the son of God. It, that, that would be my suggestion on that. I hadn't really noticed that part. Yeah, right there, that's going to be contrasted to in these latter days he was born. Right. Physically born. Right, physically born. It was the plan of God. All along. From before time. Yep. As Joe said, not knowing exactly how they... Yeah. I mean, obviously, I, not that I'm trying to defend them <laughs> or anything, but you, to give them the benefit of the doubt, I, again, there's nothing that suggests that they were, had changed their mind on this and that they thought Jesus was created in any way. So I, I would tend to think uh, that that begotten simply applies to his role, the fact that he has always been and he has always had that role, which I believe that's true. I mean, there's nothing to suggest that it's not. Anything else with, uh, with this uh, definition? All right. If I ever wrote a 500 word essay <laughs> in one sentence, it would have gone well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and again, you know, we notice some of the contrast between these, these four councils or three councils uh, regarding their attempts to define it, and then somebody found some loophole or some way to twist it, and so. Th they, risking the, the danger of being redundant over and over again, they said it so many different ways to try to, to really bring this thing home to make sure everybody understands this is the nature of Jesus. Thankfully, this was inconfusedly. Inconfusedly, yeah, totally inconfusedly, right? Indivisibly, inseparably. It just makes it makes it more difficult. It really does. I mean, if you just look at the scriptures, can, do you walk away thinking, "Oh, well, Jesus had to be two different people inside of one body"? 
There's nothing in the scriptures that suggests that. This is just man taking, especially given the fact of the belief that the flesh is inherently sinful. I mean, ultimately, the you know, beginnings of the Roman Catholic Church, they were the ones that brought this on themselves. By holding to that facet that all flesh is sinful, well, then what about Jesus? And so that it really isn't until at this point that they've really kind of tried to figure out a way to deal with that. So, anything else through the definition? All right, the canons that they issued, this is by far, or I would say, the, the by far the most comprehensive in terms of the issuance of decrees. Keep in mind that the Western Roman side of the Catholic Church is going to re reject these in principle, at least from the perspective that since the Pope was not a part of this process, and most of these are being done as a, as a means of trying to appease the Eastern side of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Is, is, it, is the answer within the Holy Fathers only the certain ones that they considered the Holy Fathers wrote or said or decreed? You've got to follow those. Right. Right. Well, and that's what the, the canons of every synod of the Holy Father shall be observed. That harkens directly back to specifically these uh, three. That's why these are the three ecumenical and four now. Uh, that's why these are the, called the ecumenical councils. There were a bunch of other councils and synods, the Synod of Hippo, for instance, where people got together to discuss things, but the Holy Fathers, the ones who had the authority, and ultimately that's kind of what the Holy Fathers refers to. It's the ones who had the authority originating all the way back because of apostolic succession to that first council, uh, that this is kind of who they saw as being the ones in charge. So uh, uh, the, the, the canons of every synod of the Holy Fathers these are the ecumenical councils that have been established. And, and to be fair, nothing they've said has directly contradicted any of the other ecumenical councils we've, we've, we've gone over. Some of the other councils and synods that got together on their own, there were councils among the Western Church, there were councils among the Eastern Church, and those kind of contradicted one another. But the, the, the ones where they're all represented, this is, they, they have been fairly consistent, at least as far as what they've issued. The seas are represented. The representative cities were all there. Yep. So that's kind of the thought of number one. Yeah, all five. You've got the uh, uh, Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, and uh, what was the fifth one? Jerusalem? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah. All right. Um, Number two, whoso buys or sells an ordination down to a prosmenarius shall be in danger of losing his grade. Such shall also be the case with go-betweens. If they be clerics, they shall be cut off from their rank. If laymen or monks, they shall be anathematized. Uh, so a prosmenarius is kind of the lowest job, I guess you could say, among the, the Catholic Church, among the clergy. Uh, whoever buys or sells an ordination shall be in danger of losing his grade. Um, this was a, a, apparently this was kind of an issue. I, I looked up a little bit about the background of this, and apparently there were a lot of people on the side who were trying to make money and using their positions kind of as a means of, of pressuring people, lay people, so to speak, uh, into giving them funds and offering them blessings and so forth and so this was kind of part of that part of that issue anything with number two let's find the use of that term go between you know, we talk about the past is priests yeah you know, go between the people and god yeah that's still kind of interesting you know use there or description yeah. there yeah yeah and you're seeing the separation between people and god as opposed to Christians being the, the priests of the, of the holy priesthood, now you're, you're having this separation between the, the common man and the clergy or the clerics. Yep. Yeah. All right. And we know what anathematized means. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really bad. Uh, of course, uh, the idea of anathema uh, or the anathematized is kind of the idea of excommunication, being cursed and sent away, that type of thing. 
All right, those who assume the care of secular houses should be corrected unless perchance the law called them to the administration of those not yet come of age from which there is no exemption unless further their bishop permits them to take care of orphans and widows. I couldn't find a lot of background on this as to what they mean by to ca the care of secular houses unless uh, th my best guess would be that somehow or another they took possession of or were administrating the homes of, that don't belong to them, that in some way they were kind of inserting themselves in order for, again, financial gain was kind of the best thing that I had in terms of a thought process, and they could only do so with permission of their bishop. So, anyway, all right. Number four, domestic oratories and monasteries are not to be erected contrary to the judgment of the bishop. Every monk must be subject to his bishop and must not leave his house except at his suggestion. A slave, however, cannot enter the monastic life without the consent of his master. So notice how the, the monasteries and, of course, the nunneries would come eventually. This, this idea of being given to a service of God and so forth is very much a part of this codification of the Roman Catholic Church now. This is the first time that we've seen any type of, of restrictions placed on, and for that matter, as far as I can remember, any, any mention of monks and monasteries and so forth. So this is uh, a, little bit, a little bit more um, regulate, regulated, I guess you could say. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does any of this so far have anything to do with Scripture? No. Not a single one of these things has anything to do with Scripture. This is just a regulation of a government, really is what it sounds like. It's, it's a government regulating what all its hands are in. Uh, those who go from city to city shall be, sub shall be subject to the canon law on the subject. Um, I was trying to understand what this one meant, and the only thing I can figure is that what they were talking about was the accepted practices and laws of each city, or for that matter, region, that they must still abide by those laws. Uh, there wasn't a lot of background available on this other than the fact that those who are kind of traveling or transient, that they go from place to place, that they have to subject themselves. They can't just claim, well, I'm a citizen of Rome, I'm not subject to your laws, and uh, my understanding is, you know, obviously that, that's not right. So, uh, Number six, in martyries and monasteries, ordinations are strictly forbidden. Should anyone be ordained therein, his ordination shall be reputed of no effect. And, of course, ordinations are what? What's, what would be an ordination? <coughs> if somebody's ordained... Yeah, I've been made a priest, a member of the clergy, and of course this, this is kind of, once again, showing the separation between the two. In fact, uh, the ordinations were mentioned earlier also. Uh, whoso buys or sells an ordination, again, that, that idea of, of trying to gain, I guess we could call it filthy lucre, okay? This is going back to this idea of, of kind of kind of buying your way to power, buying your way to, to control, and being ordained, and of course they've had some issues already uh, with ordinations, and they've had to uh, say, hey, this, this uh, head bishop in this place, he has no claim, and so any ordinations he issued, everybody's kicked out because they weren't legitimate. It, and, and it just kind of is getting worse and worse. The thought process regarding the monasteries is that no one can be higher than the other. And so if somebody's ordained versus somebody who isn't, you establish a hierarchy in those monasteries. That's the one thing I did find regarding monasteries is that the whole idea was that everybody was kind of of equal level. And to enter in a hierarchy there would kind of change the dynamic. Uh, that was the suggestion that I, that I read about. So that's the only thing I have on that one. Now, what exactly a martyry is... As best I can figure, it's the same thing as a monastery in essence. Um, one suggestion that I had or that I saw was that maybe the martyries were the eastern side of things, whereas the monasteries were the western side of things. Uh, it's kind of the same thing, but just in two different places. Uh, and that's why it's, both of them are utilized. Um, 
So nobody can become a priest or part of the clergy in those areas uh, or in those places. If any cleric or monk arrogantly affects the military or any other dignity, let him be cursed. What do you think? Not, not effects with an E, but affects. What do you think that has anything to do with? Somebody in charge, somebody in power over government, or somebody in power, or at least with authority of the military. Threatening them from a spiritual side. Yeah, trying to black. To do your job over here. Yeah, trying to blackmail them into doing something for them, is what it boiled down to. You had a lot of, a lot of uh, corruption. No. You you think? <laughs> A lot of corruption, so people blackmailing people in the military or in government uh, to get them to do what they want them to do. That sounds new, doesn't it? Wow. Any clergyman in an almshouse or monastery must submit himself to the authority of the bishop of the city, but he who rebels against this, let him pay the penalty. Um, there was no specific examples of this happening, but obviously with everything else that's going on, Certainly there's going to be some individuals who aren't going to want to abide by the laws that the bishop of the city sets down, and that's just a, a regulation uh, to condemn that. Litigious clerics shall be punished according to canon. Uh, if they despise the episcopal, or the, the elder, the bishop, uh, and resort to the secular tribunal. When a cleric has a contention with a bishop, let him wait till the synod sits. If a bishop have a contention with his metropolitan, let him carry the case to Constantinople. It, it sounds like a, a kind of a law, kind of lawsuits and that sort of thing. How do we handle this? So that's the litigious nature of these issues. Uh, no cleric shall be recorded on the clergy list of the churches of two cities. Uh, but he shall have strayed forth, but if he shall have strayed forth, let him be returned to his former place. If he has been transferred, let him have no share in the affairs of his former church. You can't have your hand in two different churches' treasuries. That's kind of what it boils down to. Or, or have, claim to have authority in both areas or something like that. Let the poor who stand in needs of help make their journey with letters pacificatory and not commendatory, for letters commendatory should only be given to those who are open to suspicion. In other words, if there's any suggestion, commendation letters is kind of my understanding of this. That way, this individual is vouched for and that sort of thing. Um, Again, there's not a lot of background on some of this stuff. Obviously, some of these things are being written with a purpose in mind based on what they were facing, but a lot of these just didn't have a lot of background on them. So, any thoughts so far? Number 12, one province shall not be cut into two. Whosoever, whoever shall do this shall be cast out of the episcopate. Such cities are, as are cut off by imperial rescript shall enjoy only the honor of having a bishop settled in them. But all the rights pertaining to the true metropolis shall be preserved. Uh, the metropolis in reference here is these main, main areas of, of the diocese, so to speak. And that's kind of the reference to cutting off as if I'm making my own diocese or my, making my own realm of authority. And that, you can't do that. Uh, no cleric shall be received to communion in another city without a letter commendatory as to what exactly that idea of communion means. He already mentioned the idea of of uh, not joining himself to another city and claiming to have authority in both, unless they're actually talking about the actual communion, but I don't think that's what they mean. Um, so it's kind of weird. Uh, number 14, a cantor or lector alien to the sound faith. If being then married, he shall have begotten children. Let him bring them to communion if they had been if they had there been baptized. But if they had not yet been baptized, they shall not be baptized afterwards by the heretics. I had a lot of questions with this one. I don't know what a cantor or a lector means. Uh, the best, uh, my understanding, is that these are regional type of things. These are people who uh, are not part of the regions of the Catholic Church authority. They're alien, okay? They're foreigners, so to speak. Uh, they come to the faith. For instance, a, a Catholic marries somebody outside of the of the. Uh, Catholic Church's uh, influence, or however you want to say that, this is kind of dealing with that 
with that. Uh, he should, if, if, for instance, if this individual had children, you know, bring the communion. If they had there been baptized, it's, it's weird. Into, it could be into fellowship, yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, in the New Testament, there are times where that, that term is translated communion, the idea of, of being together, of identifying with one another as being Christians. So that could be, yeah. yeah. Number 15, no person shall be ordained a deaconess except she be 40 years of age. If she shall dishonor uh, her ministry by contracting a marriage, let her be anathema. To my knowledge, this is the first time deaconess is even mentioned in the codifications of the Catholic Church. Okay, nothing I have ever read ever mentioned deaconesses before. Okay? Now, what is the only time in the New Testament any age limit is ever placed on anything? Widows indeed. Widows indeed are the only ones who are given an age limit, uh, or at least what to be qualified or considered to be part of that, that group of, of widows indeed. And of course, there's others as well. So, that's, that's not to take an office. No, that's not to take an office. Not at all. That's for the, the church to give a, a continual help to that widow indeed who's a fellow Christian. Uh, but this is describing a deaconess. This is a woman who apparently in some form or fashion, now where they're holding these offices, I don't know. Because... Uh, and I don't know, modern day, I don't know if there's even deaconesses now in the Catholic Church. Maybe in the Roman Catholic Church, but I don't think in the, the Western United States version of the Catholic Church uh, that there are women deaconesses. Now, in terms of, of employees or, or women like secretaries and that sort of thing, I know that they had like servants who were women. Maybe that's what they're referring to as deaconesses. Uh, but... There's an age limit for this. Um, she should not be married, which ultimately sets the stage for what? The nuns. Yeah, this is eventually what's going to turn into nunneries and so forth. Uh, not yet. As to my knowledge, the nunneries haven't come about yet, but it's going to kind of set the stage for that. Yeah. Uh, 16. Monks or nuns shall not contract marriage, but if they do so, let them be excommunicated. Again, the concept of nuns here refers to the deaconesses. Uh, everything I've looked at suggests that actual nunneries and the concept of nuns don't come into effect until 600 A.D. or so. So this is kind of a reference to the deaconess or these individuals who have given themselves to the service of the church and they have particular jobs that they're doing. So that's monks and, and nuns or, again, deaconesses. Uh, but they're not supposed to be in marriage. If they do, they're to be excommunicated. Village and rural parishes, if they have been possessed for 30 years, they shall so continue. Uh, within that time, the matter shall be subject to adjudication, yada, yada. Um, sign on shall be held wherever the bishop metropolis. All of these things are just, it's, it's just constant regulation and so forth. Uh, number 28 and 29 are kind of the ones I wanted to make sure we, we covered Tonight, the Bishop of New Rome, which is Constantinople, shall enjoy the same privileges as the Bishop of the Old Rome on account of the removal of the empire. For this reason, the Metropolitans of Pontus of Asia and Thrace, as well as the barbarian bishops, shall be ordained by the Bishop of Constantinople. So Rome was the center of the western side, and then Constantinople is the center of the eastern side, and anybody who's going to be ordained has to be done so through the authority of Constantinople. That causes a major issue going forward. Uh, he is sacrilegious who degrades a bishop to the rank of a presbyter. Ooh, terrible. For he that is guilty of crime is unworthy of the priesthood, but he that was deposed without cause, let him still be a bishop. Uh, and then number 30, it is custom for the Egyptians that none subscribe without the permission of their archbishop. Wherefore, they are not to be blamed who did not subscribe the epistle of Holy Leo. That's that tome of Leo we talked about until an archbishop had been appointed for them. Uh, that's the representation of the these people in Egypt uh, as not having been included in some of this stuff. And so that's kind of why they're talking about that. So these are the, there were 27 originally, I think, 28 was added on, and then 29 and 30 were tacked on later after 29 was. Um, so those are the 30 canons of the Council of Chalcedon, and that concludes these notes. Now, before the second bell rings, I did want to kind of talk to you guys a little bit. So I know some of this stuff is 
um, real technical and, and maybe we're delving a little bit too deep into it. Uh, going forward, I intend just to kind of hit highlights instead of going through some of these things that really don't apply to us, although they're interesting, maybe, maybe not uh, on the level of, of worthy of class time. Um, because I, I do want to kind of move a little bit faster through this, uh, but I did want to ask everybody if, if, does anybody have any suggestions as far as how to, to make this study better, or do y'all want to just stop the study altogether? If it's not helpful or if nobody's getting anything out of it, we can move on to something else. Um, again, the goal is to eventually get to uh, the formation of these Protestant churches, you know, Meth uh, the Methodist church, Baptist church, that sort of thing. I, I think that that might especially be applicable to us. But, but a lot of these background things, and like I said, after this fourth council, everything kind of goes pretty quick. But a lot of these background things help set the stage for what's going to happen in the 13 and 1400s. Uh, so that's kind of why we, we talked a little bit about it. But does anybody have any thoughts or suggestions as far as the class and class material? Um, well, I will say this, our goal is to cover one denomination or one main denomination per class. So that covers just basic highlights of who started it, how it came about, what its main beliefs are to kind of give us a, a, a rundown on it, and then to cover one denomination per class. So, you know, we got Methodist, you got uh, Baptist, you got um, uh, Protestant, or, or, uh, uh, Presbyterian, um, so you got, you got several different you know, main ones that we want to cover just to kind of give ourselves a background on that. But I'm thinking maybe three months. Are is we at the point to start going into those? Almost, yeah, almost. Because from the 600 to, I think it's 1,200, there's like maybe three or four things that we want to talk about um, that we'll have on our notes. And then after that, we'll be getting into the the main issues of the Reformation and so forth. So, yes, ma'am. No, we'll have study questions for the denominations. Yeah, we'll definitely do that because what we're going to talk about, the main focus of that's going to be the scripture side. So we'll talk about its history a little bit, and then we'll also talk about here's what their main beliefs are, what scriptures uh, you know, make it clear that this is a, not a correct teaching or you know, something along that line. So we'll be focusing in on, because a lot of this is going to be to help us, to equip us to talk to our friends and our neighbors about maybe history that they don't even know. You know one time I preached a lesson on uh, Mormonism, and there was a, a former Mormon in the audience, and after the, cla after the, the sermon, she came up to me and said, there was stuff about the past of, of the Mormon church I didn't even know. They didn't teach me that stuff. So a lot of these denominations, their histories and the Catholic Church's history, even the people who subscribe to it, does, they, don't, they don't know a lot of this. And if they did, it might actually help them a little bit to come to the conclusion that this obviously isn't from God, it's from man. So yeah, we will have questions associated with denominations. Uh, so what we'll plan to do is the, the next set of notes will cover everything up to the Reformation. Okay, that will cover just kind of the main points uh, that we'll probably get through in a week, two tops, and then we'll start getting into denominations. Does that sound okay with everybody? All right, and if anybody has any other suggestions or thoughts, see me after, after service tonight and, and we'll talk more about it. Thank you, everybody.